The National Desk, America's News, now. Nerve-wracking negotiations. The president and congressional leaders discuss raising the debt ceiling. The fact-check team breaks down what happens if a deal is not reached before the looming deadline. Then, Republican Representative George Santos faces more than a dozen federal charges, what crimes he's accused of committing, and which of his colleagues is reversing their support for him. Plus, as artificial intelligence becomes increasingly popular, the White House is digging into the potential vulnerabilities with the technology. From the nation's capital, this is The National Desk, America's News Now. Thanks for being here with us. I'm Dee Dee Gatton, and on this weekend edition, we take a look at the big headlines of the week and look ahead at what to expect, starting with the four big stories we've been following all week. Pandemic era border policy, Title 42 expired on Thursday. The risks migrants and border patrol agents face this weekend. Then the latest inflation report, some say signals the Fed may back off on future interest rate hikes. As people pick up more jobs to make ends meet, we break down new data. And the Biden administration proposing changes to protect air travelers, the benefits you could receive during future flight delays. Plus, as a shocking number of children die from fentanyl overdoses, the crime classification one politician is suggesting to fight back. Talking about your money, more Americans say money is hurting their mental health. A new bank rate survey found 52% say money negatively impacted their well-being. Compare that to last year when 42% of respondents said that. The pace of inflation eased slightly last month but still remains high as the Federal Reserve weighs whether to raise interest rates again to bring surging prices under control. Prices were up 4.9% in April compared to a year ago. The rising prices of shelter, gasoline and used cars fueled the latest inflation numbers. And analysts say the lower than expected CPI report helped makes the case for the Fed to pause its rate hikes. The Federal Reserve has been raising interest rates to get inflation down to 2%. After the latest increase last week, the Fed's now taking a wait and see approach beyond May. For many American workers, the typical day was once nine to five and then call it a day. And that seems to be changing. New research suggests one in three people have a side job to make some extra cash. I recently looked into why some say they need the extra money. I definitely grew up thinking I was just going to have one job and, you know, be able to make a good living and provide for myself. But cost of living has gone up astronomically. Inflation is crazy. From nine to five, Lauren Jack is a marketing manager, but it's not her only job. She's a content creator who also makes money through social media posts. It was just so stressful because I was barely making it. And I was like, there has to be another way around this. Jack isn't alone. Data analytics company Kantar questioned 10,000 people in 10 countries. Their research found side hustling spans generations and Gen Z is most impacted, with 40 percent having two or more roles, according to their study. Director of the Institute for Economic Forecasting at the University of Central Florida, Dr. Sean Snay, says as we see cost of living increases, he's not surprised by the data. Necessity is the mother of invention, and if you're one job isn't, uh, you know, isn't paying all the bills, then, you know, I think many people are kind of forced into taking either that side job. Citing data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, MarketWatch says in March, there were more than 8 million multiple job holders, or 5.1 percent of the total employed population. They say that's up from the about 7.5 million during the same period last year. There could be some volatility over the next couple of months, but I would suspect over the next year or so, uh, this trend should start to reverse itself somewhat. We have a disadvantage in the sense that, you know, the traditional way of being successful isn't necessarily the way anymore. Um, so it can be scary or you can think of it as an opportunity to create your own path. And Dr. Snaith adds employers are still navigating their way through the changes COVID-19 brought to the labor market, like working from home. As some look for remote or hybrid work, he says this could have ripple effects in other areas like commercial real estate. 
Flight delays, cancellations sometimes stranded at the airport. If it didn't happen to you over the last several months, you might know someone who can relate. President Biden gave a preview of a proposal for new regulations that would require airlines to compensate passengers if they're stranded for reasons within the airline's control. That includes covering meals and hotel rooms in addition to ticket refunds. I know how frustrated many of you are with the service you get from your U.S. airlines, especially after you, the American taxpayer, stepped up in 2020, in the last administration, in the early days of the pandemic to provide nearly $50 billion in assistance to keep the airline industry and its employees afloat. I get it. That's why our top priority has been to get American air travelers a better deal. Airlines for America, which represents the biggest carriers, tweeted in part 66% of cancellations from August 2022 through February 2023 were attributable to extreme weather and the national airspace system including ATC staffing shortages and modernization challenges, saying extreme weather is one of the biggest impacts to airline operations. In President Biden's announcement, he also detailed a new website, flightrights.gov, which features a dashboard he says is meant to give air travelers more transparency about airline compensation policies. The Biden administration now proposing new energy standards on household appliances, like dishwashers, which would reduce the total amount of allowable water used from five gallons to 3.3. The Department of Energy is saying the new regulations could help save Americans 652 million in utility bills every year. The administration also proposing new energy regulations for gas hookups earlier this year. Recently, New York lawmakers agreed to a ban on gas connections and new construction, starting with small buildings in 2025. Great news for online shoppers. New data from Adobe Analytics found prices for e-commerce fell nearly 2% in April compared to last year. April also marked the eighth straight month of decreasing prices. The biggest drop was in the appliance category. I'm back with Courtney and Janae from the Fact Check team. And Janae, tell us what would happen if Congress and President Biden can't reach a deal on the debt limit? Well, Didi, default is the big fear, meaning the country would not have the money to pay its bills. But I just found out some experts think President Biden can act alone by invoking the 14th Amendment. Now, like we discussed earlier, the 14th Amendment says the validity of the public debt of the United States shall not be questioned. Now, experts under this law say the president could continue continue issuing debt without raising the limit on borrowing. And is, is the administration looking into this option? Well, according to the New York Times, White House officials have discussed this, but in a recent interview, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen said, if things get to a point where the president has to go on issuing debt, it would be, quote, a constitutional crisis. And Courtney, we know that you've, you've been looking into how a default would look. What did you find on that? So financial experts say the scope is unknown because the U.S. has never intentionally defaulted on its obligations. But this would likely lead to a financial crisis and a recession that would impact the global economy too. Break this down even further. How could this impact our viewers, people nationwide? It could mean delays or just no money at all for things like Social Security and Medicare benefits, tax refunds, and military paychecks, just to name a few examples. The White House also says interest rates for mortgages and credit cards could go up, while stocks and the value of the dollar would fall. Thank you both for your research on how this could impact uh, us as a nation. Coming up, the Fact Check team will continue to follow the developments on this as well as other issues. You can see in that QR code on your screen to read this story with links to where they found their information or visit our website, thenationaldesk.com. New details on slipping support for embattled Congressman George Santos. Speaker Kevin McCarthy responded after the Republican from New York pleaded not guilty to federal charges. Santos said that he's running for re-election. Are you going to support him? <laughs> You're not. These court sketches show Santos making his first court appearance facing 13 criminal charges. Here's a breakdown of the indictment. Santos faces seven counts of wire fraud, three counts of money laundering, two counts of false statements to the House, and one count of theft of public funds. Santos refuses to step down and is blasting the case. Now I'm going to have to go and fight to defend myself. The reality is, is it's a witch hunt. A criminal indictment doesn't automatically lead to removal from Congress. There are no federal laws that affect the status of a lawmaker who has been charged with or even found guilty of a felony. 
Right now, a flash flooding threat this weekend taking aim at South Texas, including along the border where the water level of the Rio Grande River is being closely monitored. The National Desk Joe DiCarlo, DiCarlo has more on the risk posed, especially with Title 42 now lifted. We're talking about five, six years since we've seen a footprint this large with this much rainfall in that section of Texas. Gregory Waller, a hydrologist for the National Weather Service West Gulf River Forecast Center, says he is worried about the flood potential along the Rio Grande this weekend. And we're seeing the possibility of moderate, if not major flooding. Moderate or major flooding means it is having impacts to buildings, to primary roads, primary highways, uh, that type of thing. So it's not just that the river's out of its banks, it's we're starting to see significant impacts. And with Title 42 ending, it may just be a perfect storm for problems as water levels could rise fast. That area of Texas, we see very large rain events. Uh, we see very rapid responses, so it will not be a slow, gradual up and down. This may put local residents, migrants, and Border Patrol agents in danger. They want to avoid a tragedy like last year when Texas National Guardsman Bishop Evans died in the river trying to save migrants. Because of this concern, Governor Greg Abbott has directed the Texas Division of Emergency Management to deploy swift water rescue resources ahead of flash flooding potential, both along the border and across the state. We are anticipating conditions to deteriorate over the weekend, uh, heavy rain and the possibility of flash flooding and river flooding. And that was Joe DiCarlo reporting new details. Now the CEO of OpenAI will testify before Congress this week about artificial intelligence as the technology's popularity explodes. Sam Altman will answer questions from a Senate panel Tuesday about what laws might be needed to protect Americans. It's the first time lawmakers will have a chance to question Altman since his company's chat GPT took the world by storm last year. Since then, investors have turned to AI and critics have worried about its misuse. Right now, the White House is coordinating with popular tech companies like OpenAI and Google to get hackers to find AI vulnerabilities. It'll happen at this summer's DEF CON hacker convention in Las Vegas. California Congressman Ted Lieu, who is pushing for AI regulation, says it needs to be looked at closely. Artificial intelligence is going to make a lot of human tasks easier and replicate a number of human tasks. It can also make mistakes and errors. And several of the hackers taking part are red teams that have been authorized by the companies themselves. The Biden administration is working to put together an AI bill of rights, setting principles and placing guardrails around AI. New details. The founder of FTX wants most of the charges against him to be dropped. Sam Bankman frieds lawyers say prosecutors charged him quickly and did not explain the offenses he's accused of committing. They want the judge to toss 10 out of 13 criminal counts against him. Bankman frieds cryptocurrency company declared bankruptcy in November. Prosecutors say Bankman fried misled investors and lenders and that he stole billions in customer funds. Ahead here on the National Desk, America's News Now. The AI danger you may not see coming. How a simple phone call from a name and voice you recognize may be anything but. Plus, a dramatic mid-air rescue. The expert assistance from one quick-thinking passenger coming up next.
The National Desk team of reporters is bringing you the headlines from coast to coast. We're taking the pulse of America, starting in Utah, where students are warning people to watch out for AI scams as the technology becomes even more advanced. I was annoyed, I was angry, frustrated at myself. I should know better. Wendy Farr responded to an urgent email she thought was from a colleague asking her for help buying gift cards. It didn't even occur to me till after I went and I bought them, five of them at 100 bucks a piece. The email was actually from a scammer pretending to be her colleague. Anyone can get scammed. And now with artificial intelligence or AI, the Federal Trade Commission warns that scammers are stepping things up cloning people's voices to call victims and scare them into giving them money. A lot of these callers, they create this sense of, you know, urgency or someone's life is on the line. You'll get a phone call and it'll be from a family member, maybe your son or daughter, and they'll be crying or ask or sound very distressed. Maggie and Nick are cybersecurity students at UVU, where Professor Brandon Amaker prepares them to deal with threats from new technology, including AI. AI is really a computer program which is designed to emulate human behavior. Professor Amaker says with AI, stealing someone's voice to scam others is easy. Although having your voice stolen is frightening. The many scams that, that we've seen thus far are just kind of the beginning. Maggie says don't panic. AI is doing some good things like helping doctors read scans and x-rays and diagnosing illnesses. AI is a tool like any other. A knife can be used for self-defense or used in cooking, but it can also be used for nefarious purposes. The state of Utah recently formed a cybersecurity commission, but there are no local laws to protect Utahns from AI scams specifically. In Las Vegas, a Nevada lawmaker acted quickly after a passenger stopped breathing on a flight into the city. Assemblyman Ryan Hibbett says he was on a flight when there were cries for help and a man lying in the aisle not breathing. He and other passengers administered CPR and then flight staff used an AED. Long, long time ago, uh, I was trained as an EMT. Uh, I spent my career working in law enforcement. Um, so it's in my nature, I guess I would say, to act where I can, to help where I'm able to. Medical personnel were waiting at the door when the flight arrived at the airport. There was no word on the status of the passenger, but Hibbett says he was breathing on his own. In Nashville, Tennessee, a 14-year-old is behind bars after police say the teen stole a school bus and crashed it. Authorities say the teen stole the bus from Kipp College Prep and drove 20 miles away, stopping at a gas station. Shortly after, they started pursuing the teen who hit a car entering the highway. Officers threw down spikes, broke the glass door to the bus, and tasered the driver, who they say tried to continue operating the bus. The teen is facing a slew of charges. Taping, taking aim at what some call government censorship, we speak with Senator Eric Schmidt about an effort he says to hold big tech companies accountable.
New details. A panel of FDA advisors votes unanimously to recommend the sale of an over-the-counter birth control. A final decision from the FDA is expected this summer. If approved, Opal will become the first contraceptive pill to be put on store shelves, no prescription needed. Still questions about Opal, like how much the pills would cost. An experimental skin patch is showing promise, helping to treat peanut allergies in toddlers. The patch, called Viaskin, is coated with a small amount of peanut protein that's absorbed into the skin. According to a new study in the New England Journal of Medicine, a majority of the toddlers who wore the patch for a year began to show an increased tolerance towards peanuts. The FDA has asked for more safety data about the patch in toddlers and children. Protecting your First Amendment right to free speech. Senator Eric Schmidt has unveiled a bill he says will end government censorship online. The Missouri Republican spoke with our Jan Jeffcoat about his collude act. You said all along big tech executives have no business acting as censors on behalf of the federal government. So tell us specifically how your bill would change that. Yeah, I mean, the fundamental aspect of this bill is that it, it protects people's right to free speech in the virtual town square. These big tech giants should not be able to deplatform people or take posts down. And we saw that uh, uncovered in the Missouri versus Biden lawsuit that I filed when I was attorney general about a year ago. The coordination between big government and big tech created this vast censorship enterprise. So what the Collude Act, the, the bill that I filed yesterday would do is, is if that happens, uh, these big tech giants no longer have Section 230 protections, which essentially shields them from any liability. So an individual who was deplatformed, de somebody who was censored, could sue those big tech companies. They could no longer hide behind this outdated legal protection because they're really acting as editors, as publishers, not some open platform. Right. So these companies would now be liable for what others post? Well, if they're taking posts down, if they're censoring, if they're working with government, like we saw when the Surgeon General of the United States was text messaging senior Facebook officials to take particular posts down on things like the efficacy of masks or, you know, anything related to the vaccine. I mean, the government has no business. They can't censor themselves, and they certainly can't outsource that to private companies like big tech, and that's what this bill's really getting at. So what's the recourse then? What happens if a tech company violates this. Yeah, so if, if you've been damaged, right, if you've been fired or because of some post that gets highlighted, that gets taken down, you can sue and you can uncover a lot of these, you know, internal emails, uh, take these folks to court because right now you can't. Uh, they claim Section 230 protections. Uh, they, they can't be sued because they're not a publisher like a news organization or a magazine or a newspaper. And that was given back in 1996 when the, when the Internet was sort of this new frontier, right? Okay, you're going to be a platform, host all these different points of view. Well, they've changed that now. They have a point of view. They're, you know, taking down disfavored opinions, regulating content, which they're not allowed to do, especially if they're coordinating with, uh, with the government. Why do you think it's so hard to get all the lawmakers on board with something like this? Well, I don't know that it is. I think there's actually a pretty broad agreement that we need to do something on big tech, whether it's on privacy, protecting kids, or free speech. And you also have some antitrust issues. So my hope is that there'll be a unique bipartisan uh, solution to this. And I think this bill goes a long way in protecting, again, people's fundamental right to express themselves, not just on the town square, but in the virtual town square as well. And the reason I ask this, Senator, is because the federal government overwhelmingly all agreed to, to ban TikTok from government-issued devices, and yet we're still allowing this app for American teens. Should there be a complete ban of TikTok? Where do you stand on this issue? I do. I think there should be, and because I view it differently. Uh, this is not content. This is about conduct. And this is essentially an AI weapon, a Chinese AI weapon aimed directly at the United States in the hands of our kids. And they're spying on us. They're taking sensitive information. And make no mistake about it, this is the CCP. This isn't some fun, you know, dance app. This is communist China collecting data and spying on us. And I think that puts it in its own category. Still ahead here on the National Desk, the story's making headlines next week, where former Fox News host Tucker Carlson says he's launching a new version of his primetime show.
Taking a look at the top trending stories on our website right now, just weeks after being ousted from Fox News, Tucker Carlson announced a new version of his primetime show to Twitter. We'll have more details on his move in 10 minutes. And a new survey showing nurses feel worse off now than they did during the pandemic. AMN Healthcare surveyed more than 18,000 registered nurses and found a 10-point drop in career satisfaction compared to its last survey in 2021. And in Missouri, legal cannabis sales surpassed the $1 billion mark last week. The sale of cannabis for recreational use among adults began on February 3rd. Those stories and much more available right now at thenationaldesk.com. Looking ahead to stories making headlines this week, National Police Week kicks off Sunday. The week honors those who died in the line of duty with events scheduled through the week. April's U.S. retail sales report drops next Tuesday. It serves as an indicator on how much the economy is growing or shrinking. It's a key report as the Federal Reserve fights inflation. And Kentucky is holding a primary next Tuesday. The races on the ballot include Kentucky Governor, Auditor, Secretary of State, Agriculture Commissioner, and State Treasurer. Straight ahead, an increase in fentanyl deaths among children, according to a new report. Why one lawmaker is now fighting for classifying overdoses as a felony homicide. Then, detecting emerging COVID-19 variants. The new partnership between a major U.S. airport and the CDC. You're watching the National Desk, America's News Now. You can catch us live weekdays from 6 a.m. to 11 a.m. and 10 p.m. to midnight Eastern Time and anytime online at thenationaldesk.com. We'll be right back. The National Desk, America's News, now. The gold standard shifting. The new cancer screening recommendation for women now a decade earlier. Then dangerous conditions along the southern border prompt one migrant family to take desperate action to enter the U.S. We'll take a closer look and losing traction. President Biden slumping poll numbers and where he stands now against his top competitors. From the nation's capital, this is The National Desk, America's News Now. I'm Dee Dee Gatton. Thanks for being here. Deadly overdoses involving fentanyl have gone up significantly among children in the U.S. According to data published in the journal JAMA Pediatrics, more than 5,000 children and teens have died from overdoses involving fentanyl in the past two decades. More than half of those deaths happened in the first two years of the COVID-19 pandemic. Researchers say the findings show more steps are needed to address the crisis. 
Right now, in the fight against the opioid epidemic, Virginia Governor Glenn Youngkin has dedicated a new trove of state resources to the issue through an executive order. The National Desk, Kayla Gaskins, digs into the new approach to the growing crisis. That is very risky. Visiting a high school on National Fentanyl Awareness Day. Come on, staff. Here we go. Here we go. A deliberate choice by Yunkin as the amount of kids dying from the drug increases every year. No more fentanyl. The Journal of the American Medical Association publishing new research showing fentanyl overdose deaths among children increased 3,740 percent from 2013 to 2021. As of Tuesday, fentanyl now classified as a weapon of terrorism in Virginia. It is a very important tool, and I'm thrilled that we were able to get that done, but we're not stopping there. Youngkin pushing to make fentanyl overdose deaths felony homicides. State Democrats pushing back. Do you think Democrats are too lax when it comes to addressing the fentanyl crisis? I, I think Democrats placed drug dealers over Virginians, and it's just absolutely unfathomable to me that they would not vote to support raising the penalty for distributing fentanyl that kills someone, raising the penalty to a homicide. While most agree fentanyl is a massive problem, red and blue states differ on solutions. New York City already operating safe consumption sites, places people can do drugs under medical supervision. People are using drugs in an environment where if they do overdose, you can reverse the overdose without them dying. Similar projects in the works in Rhode Island, Massachusetts, Colorado, and California. Advocates say it cuts down on public drug use while lowering the risk of HIV and overdosing. Youngkin says you won't see one in Virginia under his watch. Let me tell you, in Virginia, we are not following California's lead on anything. We find that common sense needs to be in the building, not radical policies. These centers are still illegal under federal law. I'm Kayla Gaskins reporting. A federal health task force now recommends all women with an average risk of breast cancer start screening at age 40. That's a decade earlier than previously suggested to get a mammogram. Important to know this is a draft recommendation which is not final and will be available on the task force website for public comment through June 5th. A new effort to test for emerging coronavirus variants involves testing sewage from commercial airplanes. Now, the San Francisco International Airport is the first airport to team up with the Centers for Disease Control to test wastewater from flights. Officials say traces of the virus that causes COVID-19 can be detected in people's feces when they're infected, even if they don't have symptoms. The samples will be collected from some international flights arriving at SFO. Last weekend, Border Patrol reported just over 1,000 migrant encounters at the El Paso border crossing. Rio Grande Valley sector reported 2,600 and the Del Rio sector 1,300. Among those encounters, a family from Venezuela who says their child has cerebral palsy. After attempting for six weeks to come into the country legally, sheer desperation forced them to do the unthinkable. The National Des Yami Verhin has their story. The final obstacle, the Rio Grande. There are many risks involved. <laughs> After months of traveling, the goal was right in front of their eyes, the U.S. border. Alejandra and her family are from Venezuela. She has a two-year-old and a six-year-old with cerebral palsy. Because of the dangerous journey, a wheelchair was not an option. Alejandra, her husband and nephew, took turns carrying the child through the jungle in Colombia and Panama, through Central America, and now at the cartel-ridden Mexican border. After waiting for six weeks to get an appointment on the U.S. government app called CBP-1 to cross legally under the asylum process, the family got desperate on Sunday. The family's concern about their safety since they have no money left for food. They feel crossing the Rio Grande River is their only option. 
si puedo, lo paso. A few minutes after we did this interview, the family put their things in a plastic bag and made their way down the embankment. In the name of God is what they said as their nephew stepped into the water with their daughter and their two-year-old with Alejandra's husband. The person that was getting the video had to leave due to the cartel showing up and threatening their life. But they did manage to see the family make it to the U.S. side. Hundreds more were waiting right behind them to cross. Reporting in San Antonio, Texas, I'm Dami Virgen. And right now, more details on Tucker Carlson's new gig. The former Fox News host will soon be signing on from a popular platform. The Fire TV News personality said in a video posted on Twitter. This week, he's relaunching his show on Twitter. Carlson was abruptly fired weeks ago. Fox News recently reached a settlement with Dominion Voting Systems, averting a defamation trial. In the video, he said Twitter is not a partisan site, calling it a stronghold for free speech. Speech is the fundamental prerequisite for democracy. That's why it's enshrined in the first of our constitutional amendments. Amazingly, as of tonight, there aren't many platforms left that allow free speech. The last big one remaining in the world, the only one, is Twitter. And new CEO Elon Musk has been criticized in recent months, accused of censoring journalists during his first months as its head. And new details about Twitter. Musk says a new CEO will soon take over the platform, which now goes by the name X Corp. Here's the SpaceX and Tesla founder tweeting the news, saying she'll start in about six weeks. Musk has been CEO of Twitter since he bought the company in October. He says he'll become the company's executive chair and chief technology officer. It's back to work for Senator Dianne Feinstein. She's back in Washington, according to a spokesperson for the California Democrat. Feinstein has been out since February with shingles and subsequent uh, complications. The 89-year-old has been under pressure to return to the Senate with some calling for her to resign. Feinstein has announced she won't run for re-election next year. A new ABC Washington Post poll shows low marks for President Biden. Our fact check team has spent the night digging into the data and his overall approval rating is at 36 percent. And we talked about this. That is down from six points from February. So, Janae, starting with you, any key groups or, or trends that we should be watching that stand out? Well, Dee, Dee the drop in support from African-Americans is very notable. Now, black people are a core group for Democrats and the president's rating with them is at 52 percent. That's down from 80 82% when he first took office. Now, 27% of black people say they would definitely or probably vote for former President Donald Trump. That doesn't seem like much, but 12% of black people voted for Trump in 2020, so his appeal might be growing. And another key group for Democrats is women. Biden is struggling with them a bit. 39% of female voters approve of the job the president is doing. And, and this research had also looked into another key group, independent voters. I know you've done a lot of research on that, Connor. What did you find? How is the president doing with them? Didi, he is not doing that well with independents. Only 30% of them approve of his job so far. And the poll shows independents favor Trump over Biden if they were to face off again, with 48% saying they would choose the former president and 39% saying they would choose President Biden. Biden is also at a low of 40% approval among moderates. And back in 2020, that support was at 64% for President Biden. But remember, polls don't always tell the full story. We're just getting a snapshot of a small population. Great points, great perspective. Thank you both for your research. And the Fact Check team will continue to follow all of the latest developments. You can scan that QR code on your screen to read this story with links to where they found their information or visit our website, thenationaldesk.com. Paramount Media slashing jobs at MTV News, cutting its U.S. workforce by 25%, ending the division. It once covered a range of issues from pop culture to politics and became a household name for Generation X and millennial adolescents. The division's president said in a memo to staff that despite the media giant's success in, in streaming, the company continues to feel pressure from broader economic impacts. Disney Plus will soon add Hulu content to its streaming app. Disney CEO says it's bundling the content to give its subscribers more streamlined access while offering more opportunities to its advertisers. Company officials announced in a quarterly earnings call that Disney Plus lost 4 million subscribers. Disney plans to start the one app offering by the end of the year.
Ahead on the national desk, America's News Now. A schoolroom staple banned. The district ban going into effect now and why some say they hope it will help keep kids safe. Plus, dozens of guns swiped. The challenge officers are now facing. This is the National Desk America's News Now. Our team of nearly 4,000 local journalists bringing you the headlines from coast to coast. From backpack ban in Texas schools to home prices finally starting to come down in Seattle, we're taking the pulse of America. Four masked men set their sights on this Springfield gun store. Now Fairfax County detectives and the ATF are trying to figure out how these burglars managed to get into Dominion Defense through a small opening over the door and get out with 53 guns. Police say it was a combination of long guns and handguns, and they could be anywhere right now. Police are concerned about where these guns could end up. The D.C. Metro has seen its share of these thefts. Burglars hit this Ashburn store back in January, and this from last year. Last month alone, criminals targeted gun stores on five different occasions. ATF found that a vast majority of stolen guns were taken from private citizens. But even though they say it's a smaller but noteworthy number of guns taken from licensees like stores, they report that most stolen guns end up being used in violent crimes. An increase in fake social media threats as we approach the end of the school year. That's what Southwest ISD says they are trying to combat. In this video they released on YouTube, it shows added safety measures, including the district's no backpacks policy for the remainder of the school year. Starting May 8th, students will not be allowed to bring backpacks to school. The video encourages parents to talk to their kids about what they should and shouldn't bring to school. Southwest ISD's new guidelines on bags till the end of the year, no bigger than eight and a half by five and a half inches. The size limitation to a clear bag, 12 by 12, and kids can bring Bring a large plastic Ziploc bag. A former Southwest High School student who currently has a brother at the school says safety measures will provide some peace of mind but won't deter a student from sliding in something illegal. Kids are sneaky so in a way they're gonna figure out a way to bring in what they want to bring in whether it's guns, drugs or anything like that. Home prices are finally making their way back down as many home buyers were priced out. In the last year or so, it's been high mortgage rates that have really made it difficult for buyers to afford borrowing to buy a home. Before that, it was the stiff competition. The report says prices have come down enough to offset rising mortgage rates in some pandemic boom towns and expensive coastal markets like Seattle and Austin, Texas. Roughly one in four homes for sale in Seattle now cost less than they would have a year ago. There are fewer buyers for every home that is on the market. And then in order for a seller to actually secure a home sale, they have to lower the price to meet buyer expectations. A more affordable home doesn't mean affordable. According to Redfin data, the median home sale 
price in Seattle was $742,000 in March. That's double the national median of about $400,000. Not enough new homes are being built or not enough dense housing, more affordable options like condos or townhomes are being built makes it more expensive to get your foot in the door for home ownership. So to come, our team of correspondents breaks down this week in Washington from the expiration of Title 42 to how the government is looking to prevent future bank failures. And welcome back. Our Washington Bureau covers the nation's capital every day to report on the important issues facing the country and how they impact you. The Bureau's correspondents are here with their insights on the stories they've been covering. Chief Political Correspondent Scott Thuman, Title 42 lifted tens of thousands of migrants and asylum seekers trying to illegally cross the U.S.-Mexico border. What's the political fallout? Well, Steve, the White House taking an inordinate amount of heat on this one. Uh, President Biden accused of overseeing an opening of the border. Of course, his Homeland Security Secretary out there across the airwaves nonstop trying to dispel that, saying that is not the case under this president. And in fact, they've deported 1.4 million immigrants over the past year, that that's similar to what we've seen in previous years, and the apprehension rate similar to past presidents. The, uh, the shift of blame they're trying to make now is to say this is on the GOP and Congress for not passing comprehensive immigration reform and additionally not giving the funding, only providing about half of what the White House has requested to better secure the border. And fentanyl coming across the border in record amounts. One reason Republicans argue why the U.S. should lock down the border. National correspondent Kayla Gaskins, you spoke to Virginia Governor Glenn Youngkin this past week about the fentanyl crisis. What do you have to say? I did. Governor Youngkin said that as we see these migrants coming across the border in record numbers, now every state is essentially a border state. We know that fentanyl gets into the United States mostly through the southern border. So it's left to governors like Youngkin to figure out how to combat this. This week, actually, uh, Governor Youngkin signed a bill into law that was passed by the state legislature designating weaponol at, or designating, excuse me, fentanyl as a weapon of Terrorism. Now, Governor Youngkin wants to push that further. He actually wants it to be considered felony homicide if somebody dies from a fentanyl overdose. But right now, with Democrats pushing back on that, designating it as a weapon of terrorism is a compromise. Uh, Governor Youngkin says that he's not done. Tackling the fentanyl issue is something he will address more during his time as governor. Meanwhile, House Republicans digging deeper into the Biden family's foreign business dealings. National correspondent Christine Frizzau, what are they accusing the president of? Well, they're accusing President Biden, Steve, of being involved with, of what they call a pay-to-play scheme. So they've laid out a lot of bank records that uh, belonging to Hunter Biden, his son. But they say that the reason that Hunter Biden was paid millions of dollars, including from foreign entities, places like China and Romania, is to buy access to his father, who was then serving as vice president. Now, I should say they did not lay any, out any evidence that laws were broken. They also didn't lay out any evidence uh, that the pr then vice president 
President Biden knew about these transactions or was involved in any way, but they say they're just getting started. What they laid out in a news conference this past week uh, was several examples of transactions and LLCs, limited liability corporations that were started. They say to conceal the payment, that the money was funneled very various LLCs, many before reaching the bank account of Hunter Biden and family members. And by the way, those family members include uh, grandchildren of President Joe Biden. So they're wondering, you know, the biggest question, they say the fundamental question here is what did they get in return? And it's important to note they still have not connected the dots yet directly to the president, something that they are trying to do throughout this investigation. National correspondent Atra el Congress looking into the recent spate of bank failures. Uh, what questions are they asking? Yeah, it's been a really tough week for bank stocks again, especially PacWest. So some of the potential reforms or rules uh, policymakers are looking at, one would be a temporary ban on short-selling bank stocks so that folks can't manipulate the market. Uh, critics of that say it's been done before. There's no real effect uh, that, the, uh, that the SEC already has uh, the ability to go after folks who do manipulate the market or try to. Another thing that that's really been top of mind since we saw Silicon Valley Bank fall and Signature Bank fall is, okay, what does the FDIC do when a failure occurs? Do they insure more than the quarter million dollar deposit limit, which they did uh, in those two cases? Uh, some say it will enable bad behavior, but look, the point is there is no quick, easy fix or guarantee that there's not another bank failure just around the corner. Atra, Christine, Kayla, Scott, thank you for staying on top of all the big stories in Washington. Really appreciate it. Didi, back to you. Team, thank you. Up next here on the National Desk, No Mo May, one community's effort to help the environment that's dividing neighbors. Right now, some Peloton owners are being told to immediately stop using their bikes. The company is recalling more than 2 million bikes sold over the last five years. The PL01 model Peloton has received at least 35 reports of the bike's seat post assembly breaking during use. The company will be making free repairs. The American Psychological Association says teens need training before they start using social media. APA President Dr. Tama Bryan says Social media isn't inherently good or bad for young people, but Brian says instruction is needed for the safe and healthy use of social media platforms. The recommendation for instruction in social media literacy and psychological development was among 10 recommendations released. Other guidance included tailoring usage to the child's age and imposing limitations on content that promotes self-harm, as well as limitations to ensure kids get enough sleep. Right now, some homeowners are debating over when to refresh their yards. It's part of a trend known as No Mow May, which started as an idea to encourage homeowners to avoid mowing in May and grow their grass long to help out our ecosystem. The National Desk Angela Brown breaks down the lawn care debate. 
Some communities are passing resolutions, dropping fines for May if you decide not to mow your grass, setting up a battle over lawn care. Advocates say it's eco-friendly and will help the bees. Critics say that taller grass can be a magnet for rodents, snakes, other animals, and that mowing makes the neighborhood look bad. That sound you may hear less often. It's no mow May. Encouraging residents to grow their grass longer. Our reporters nationwide are tracking the no mow movement, including the Portland area in Maine, to help bees. Allow those flowers to grow up so that the bees um, and other pollinators have food sources readily available to them. To understand the growing debate over no mow May, let's head to Appleton, Wisconsin, the first U.S. city to adopt no mow May back in 2020 and recently in jeopardy of being cut council members questioning its effectiveness. There are benefits to having more flowers and having more gardens that are pollinator friendly, but there's nothing that shows that growing your grass from 8 inches tall to 12 inches tall makes any difference whatsoever for pollinators. The Appleton committee rejected a resolution ending No Mo May, but critics are popping up nationwide. Some calling No Mo May good intentions, bad approach. Other elected leaders citing appearance. I think we have a problem with a lot of folks just very concerned about the look of their neighborhood. Last year, Green Bay joined the No Mo May movement. Back then, our team interviewed Dave Elson from the Brown County Beekeepers Association about the impact of Mo Bees in the ecosystem. Without honeybees to assist in pollination, there's so much of the food that we all love and enjoy wouldn't be here for us. In Washington, D.C., I'm Angela Brown. Major League Baseball is testing out new technology in the minors. Some AAA games are now being called by the automatic ball strike system or robo umps. Cameras and computers determine the pitch and the message is relayed to the home plate umpire through an earpiece. No timetable for introducing it at the major league level. That'll do it for us on the weekend edition of the National Desk America's News Now. Don't forget, you can catch us live from 6 a.m. to 9 a.m. and 10 p.m. to midnight Eastern Time. Check your local listings and you can also watch us online and catch up with the latest headlines on thenationaldesk.com. Thanks so much for watching. Have a great weekend. We'll see you back here next week.